Good morning viewers. In today's class, we shall learn about properties of sections and the various types of loads that are going to act on steel structures. To begin our discussion, first let us have a view of the photographs. Look at this photograph. This particular photograph shows a steel structure that is being used for the radar system or dish antenna. You look at the um, members that are used, their connections, then see the next photograph. This is the equipment that is used for construction purposes. If you look at it closely, we see that there are lot of steel members involved in the construction of this particular equipment. Now, let us take a look of one more photograph. Now, as you see this, this particular structure is used for offshore construction works. Take a close look at this. Here you have the steel members that are used as poles. Then you have a bridge which is constructed of steel. These are the bracings used for construction purposes. Now, from the three photographs we have seen, we have seen that lot of members are used to form a single structure. So, now let us start our discussion with the definition of a structure. Now, what is a structure? A structure is a member or a body which is subjected to loadings, which undergoes deformation and due to this deformation resistance is set up in the body such body is known as a structure so a structure is a body which offers resistance to the external deformation caused due to external loads these structures are basically used for transferring or the means of transferring the loads and movements. Now, to analyze the structures, we should know something about structural engineering. Structural engineering is a branch of engineering which is very important in civil engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, electrical engineering, wherever a structure is used. A structural engineering basically it deals with structural analysis and structural design. Now, what is structural analysis? Structural analysis is a branch of structural engineering which deals with analysis of the internal forces caused due to the loads that are impended or acting on the structures. It also deals with the suitable arrangement of the structural components so that the structure is stable. Coming to the structural design, as the name suggests, design is the process of giving size shape to a member. So, structural design, it deals with selection of proper material for a structural member, giving it proper size and shape. While selecting the size, shape or the material, we should take into account the safety and economy factors. That is, while we design a member, the member should be economical as well as it should be safe in resisting the loads as well as the stresses. Then we come to the material used in the structural members in the steel structures that is the steel. Now, what is steel? Steel is a material that is a combination of iron, carbon and other forms of alloys in small proportion. Based on the content of the steel, the type of steel varies. As you increase the strength increases and as you 
decrease the carbon content the strength and hardness decreases whereas the ductility that is the ability to stretch or break it gets reduced if you increase the carbon content. Now we said as we increase the percentage of carbon or we as we vary the percentage of carbon we have different types of steel. Now let us see what are the types of steels available. The types of steels available are mild steel, low carbon steel, high carbon steel which is also called high tensile steel, high alloy steel and low alloy steel. Of these five types of steels available, the most uh, important types that are used for structural purposes are mild steel and high tensile steel. Now we shall look at these two types for some more details. Now coming to the mild steel, mild steel is the steel which conforms to Indian standard 226 that is given in 1975. This type of steel has a carbon content which varies from 0.23 to 0.25. Mild steel has a wide range of applications that is it can be used in all types of rolled structural members, it can be used for rivets, bolts, connections etc. Now coming to the high tensile steel, as we said as we increase the carbon content the strength of the steel increases. So naturally high tensile steel will have more carbon content when compared to the mild steel. The steel which corresponds to IS 961-1975 is called the high tensile steel. The high tensile steel have uh, enhanced mechanical properties and they have better corrosion due to the increase in the alloying materials. These are generally used for all the building construction works as well as bridges. The maximum carbon content in such type of steels is limited to 0.27 percent. So once we know the types of steels that are generally used, now let us go to what are the general types of the sections that are mostly used. So these are called rolled steel sections. So what is a rolled steel section? Now let us define this. Rolled steel section is a section which is manufactured in rolling mills and it is used for structural members. These sections are named according to their uh, according to their uh, cross sectional shapes. So based on the cross sectional shapes we have the following types of the rolled steel sections. The first is called the rolled steel I section, rolled steel channel section, rolled steel T sections, rolled steel angle sections, rolled steel bars, rolled steel tubes, rolled steel sheets and strips, rolled steel flats and rolled steel plates. Now once we know the different types of rolled steel sections, let us examine the properties of each of the rolled steel sections, their designations and the situations where each one of them are used. Now let us start our discussion with the rolled steel I sections. A rolled steel I section it corresponds to the alphabet I. Now if you see in the figure, this is the rolled steel I section. It, it is in the shape of a I. So it has two flanges. So this is one flange, this is the second flange. These two flanges are connected by means of this web. The junction of the web and the flange, you see this is called the fillet. Then the height or the depth from the top of the topmost 
flange to the bottom of the bottom flange is called the depth of the I section and the width of the flange is denoted by B. Now let us see how many types of I sections are existing. Now there is a standard code of practice that is followed for steel structures that is given by the BIS that is Bureau of Indian Standards. The Bureau of Indian Standards has given a standard code of practice called IS 800. Apart from this we use handbook of steel structures known as uh, steel tables. Now these properties of all the sections are given in the handbook called steel tables. Now coming to the classification of I sections, according to the Bureau of Indian Standards, the I sections are classified into five types. The first type is the Indian Standard Junior Beams which is called ISJB. The second is Indian Standard Light Beams known as ISLB. The third is Indian Standard Medium Weight Beams denoted by ISMB. Then the fourth is Indian Standard Wide Flange Beams called ISWB and finally we have Indian Standard Column Sections which are also known as H sections. These are denoted by ISHB. Now if you want to specify a particular I section, how do we do that? We specify an I section using its designation. Now what is this designation? The designation of an I section is first given by the series to which an I section belongs. Whether it belongs to the ISMB category, ISJB category that is junior beam, medium beam, light beam or white flange beam. So depending upon its category, first we specify its series, then we specify its depth. The depth of I section is specified after the series, then we specify the weight of the beam per meter length. So if you want to specify an I section, we have to give its series depth and the weight per meter length. Now once we know how many sections are existing and how we can specify, we shall learn what are the different situations in which this particular I beams are used. The I beams are mainly used to resist the bending. That is why they are also known as beam sections. This is particular because the I section is proportioned such that the web carries the shear force whereas the flanges, the top and bottom flanges they are meant to carry the bending. Apart from being used as bending uh, structures or beams, these can also be used for built up sections in the columns. So you can use a I section in a built up form for columns and other types. Now coming to the second type of the classification, we have what is known as Indian Standard Channel Sections. These are also known as C sections. Now take a look at this particular figure. If you look at this figure, this corresponds to the letter C. Now this has again two flanges, one flange at the top, one at the bottom and joined by means of a web. Okay. So, how do we specify this? Before we come to the specification, now let us know what are the types, types of T beams that are specified by Bureau of Indian Standards. We have four types of T beams that are specified. The first one is called ISJC that is Indian Standard Junior Channels. The second is the Indian Standard Light channels given by ISLC. Next we have Indian Standard Medium Weight Channels and Indian Standard Special Weight Channels known as 
ISSC. Now to specify the type of the channel used, we again use the designation as in the case of I beams that is we first specify the series to which the channel section belong followed by the depth and the weight of the section per meter length. Now, what are the situations in which these C sections are used? The C sections or the channel sections can be used for purlins that is these purlins are the members of a roof truss or they can be used as a built up column which are connected together by means of bracings or lacing that is called battening or lacing. These, these are the connecting members used for built up beams. Now, apart from this it can be also used to resist axial tension in the form of cords used in the truss girders. Now, after this channel sections, now let us examine what are the T sections. Now, as the name suggests, T sections are in the form of the alphabet T. That is, if you look at the figure, if you have a flange connected by the web, this connection between the flange and the web is known as the fillet. So, since it corresponds to the letter T, it is known as the T section. According to the Bureau of Indian Standards, we have five types of T sections. The first is the normal T sections, second is the wide flange T sections, the third is the long leg T sections which are given as ISST, the fourth is the Indian Standard Light T bars ISLT, next we have the Indian Standard Junior T sections which are specified by ISJT. Now, once we know the types, let us specify these T sections. The T sections are designated or specified by the series to which the channel T sections belong followed by the depth and the uh, weight of the sections. Next, we come to the uses of the T sections. The T sections are mostly used to transmit bracket loads. Where these bracket loads occur? This occur uh, in the column sections. Uh, they are also used for transmitting the loads in rectangular channels in form of a connecting members. So, these are the specific uses of T sections. Now, coming to the next type of rolled steel sections, we have what are known as angle sections. The angle sections are of basically three types. The first is the equal angles, the second is the unequal angles and the third is the bulk angles. Now, what is an equal angle? Now, if you look at the first figure here, when an angle has two equal legs, it is known as equal angle that is the length of this and this legs are equal. Next, we have unequal legs. When the length of these two legs are not same, that is the two legs forming an angle are not equal, it is called an unequal angle. Next, we have what are a special type of uh, angular sections known as bulb sections. So, bulb sections are the sections which have two legs and a small projection on the top or the standing leg. So, this is the projection in the form of a bulb. So, the junction of this leg and the flange or the bulb is called the web. This is one leg and this is the other leg. Now, how do we specify these angular sections? 
angle sections are denoted by the symbol ISA that is Indian standard angle followed by the length of the two legs. For example, if I have an equal angle then we specify ISA that is Indian standard angle of 130 mm by 130 mm with a weight of 0.159 kilo newtons per meter cube that is the symbol of the angle ISA followed by the length of the two legs followed by the unit weight of the section per meter length. So, that is, that is how we denote the uh, angle whether it is an I equal, unequal or a bulk angle. Then now let us learn about the uses of the angular sections. Now if you go to the uses of the angular section, the angle sections can be used independently or it can be used as built up sections. Now first let us see the independent usage. First one if you see the angle sections are used as independent sections with 1, 2 or 4 angles to resist axial tension and compression and also to transfer forces as per lens. Now when we connect the two angles with the help of other structural members we get the built up sections. So in the built up stage it can be used as connecting elements to join together sheets or plates. Now, apart from this, we have the usage of the angles in capacity of beam seats, then we have pleat angles, stiffening ribs. These three types are used generally for the column bases which are extensively used in steel structures. Then where, they, where are these bulb angles used? These are special angles generally they find their usage in the ship building area. So, ship building is the place where we use the bulb angles. Now, let us go to the other type of the rolled steel sections called the rolled steel bars. Now, if you look at the rolled steel bars, these are the bars having different forms. We have generally two forms of rolled steel bars. One is of circular section or round section. This is the circular or the round section. The second is the square section. So, the two they are denoted by Indian standard RO means round bars. Indian standard square bars. Then how are we going to specify this? The roll steel bar sections they are denoted by the series that is if they are round bars we first write ISRO followed by the diameter of the round bar. If it is square section then we write ISSQ followed by the side width of the square section. So, where do you find the usage? The usage is generally in the ties or lateral bracings they can also be used in tension members. Next we come to what are known as rolled steel flats. So, what is a flat? A flat is a member having sufficient thickness and the width. So, these are designated by ISF that is the lettering used Indian standard flat. So, to denote these flats first we write the thickness or the width then we denote the letter ISF as seen here. This is first the width always in mm or millimeters. This is the Indian standard flat followed by the thickness of the member in millimeters that is how we specify them. Then the uses mostly these flats are used for lacing or battening sections. 
they can be also used as lateral ties. What are lateral ties? These are the members which are used in columns. Next category is the steel sheets and strips. So, sheets are denoted by ISSH, SH means sheet, Indian standard sheet. The designation is we write Indian standard sheet ISSH followed by its length in millimeters, then width in millimeters and thickness of the sheet in millimeters. Then strips, strips are the pieces which have only width and thickness. So, for the strips we specify ISST, ST means the strip, Indian standard strip followed by its width in millimeters followed by the thickness also in millimeters. Next type of the steel sections we are going to use is the roll steel plates. Now, these roll steel plates they are often used to find the building of a uh, member where the thickness required is more. How do we specify them? These are specified as ISPL that is Indian standard plates then followed by its length in millimeters you see here the width again in millimeters and thickness in the millimeters. Next coming to the uses of the flats, strips and plates. So, these are the members which are often used to construct built up sections. So, whenever we want to increase the section of a particular steel member to resist load or moments or stresses, the existing members can be strengthened by using these steel plates, sheets or strips. Now, to come into these specific uses, the plates are as I said they are used to increase the thickness which are riveted together. Then they can be used in webs, flanges of plate girders, then plates, beams, cord members, web members of a truss bridge girders. So, these are the specific uses of the plates, sheets and strips. Now, we have seen what are the different types of roll steel sections available for construction of steel structures. Now, let us have a glance at the photographs which will give you an idea of how these separate sections are used to build a massive steel structure. Now, first let us examine the first photograph. Now, if you look at this particular photograph, this is a photograph of a hanging bridge, a famous hanging bridge. So, here you can see this, these are the structural members. So, these are the members connected or that join by using individual sections which we have read about. Now, look at the next figure. This is the famous Eiffel Tower which is situated in Paris, the capital of France. So, this is considered as one of the seven wonders. You see here, this is mainly constructed of the C, I and the other forms of the roll steel structures. Now, let us see one more picture. Now, this picture, this gives you the towers which are used for cable cars or popularly known as rope ways. So, the steel members as we see here, these are used for towers. Similarly, the towers can be constructed for electricity that those are called electric towers. They can be used for information and signaling and other purposes also. Now, let us see one more picture which gives you an idea of steel structures being used in offshore construction works. So, this is the picture of an offshore construction equipment. Now, if you have a close look, now you can see the, this is the crane, this is the platform where the operations are connected. So, if you see the members here, these are the supporting structures which are constructed 
under the water you see the base are immersed in the water so these are supporting the platform on which the construction work is going on this is the construction equipment that is being used so from the photographs we have seen we know that the steel sections which we have read are of immense use so they can be used individually or connected together to form wonderful structures for the use of mankind now once we know the uses and the types of sections now let us go to the types of loads now these structures when they are constructed they are put into use once they are put into use they are subjected to different types of loadings now what are the different types of loads which a structural member is subjected to look at this particular slide here we define the loads or the loads on the structure should be such that the structural member should be safe that is when we construct a structural member we have to keep into account the various forces or loads loads are nothing but the forces various forces acting on the member so that the stresses that are coming on to the members due to the loads should be within the permissible limits now let us have a look of the types of loads now according to the uh, bureau of indian standards it has published a standard book of practice where different types of loadings and the process of calculation of these loads is given this particular code of practice is called is 875 that is published in 1987 so according to these uh, is 875 the loads can be categorized into the six types there are other loads during uh, the quality but you can see the uh, main loads that are given in the slide the first is the dead load the second type is the imposed load which is also known as the live load the third is the wind load the fourth is the earthquake load or the load coming due to the earthquake vibrations the fifth is the erection load the erection load is due to the equipment that is used during construction then finally we have loads due to secondary effects loads due to the temperatures creep shrinkage all come under the secondary effects now let us examine each of these loads in detail to start with we first go to the dead loads the dead loads as the name suggests dead a dead thing it does not move so a dead load neither moves nor changes in magnitude it is also known as a permanent load the dead load it consists of the self weight of the member and all the permanent fixtures which are attached permanently to the structure like if you take a slab a roof slab the dead weight of the slab is the self weight of the slab and it also has some finishings which are permanently there now how do we calculate this dead load now to calculate the dead load what we do is we find the volume of the member and then multiply the volume of the member with the unit weight of the material of construction how do we get the volume of the member since the depth of the section is not known we assume the depth of the section now once we assume the depth of the section depth multiplied by its width and length we get the volume this volume multiplied by the unit weight of the material of construction if we use rcc we take the unit weight of rcc if we use steel we take the unit weight of steel so by this we can calculate the dead load now how do we get the unit weights the unit weights are got from the uh, standard code
code of practice IS 875 part 1. Now, once we know how to calculate the dead load, let us see how we can calculate the live loads. We said live load or imposed load. Now, this is not the weight of the member. So, what is it? This particular load is the load that is on the structure due to its occupancy. So, occupancy of the structure produces what is known as the imposed load. Now, since we said it is imposed or live, why did we say it is a live load? Because it changes both in magnitude as well as the position. It is not same all the time. It may change its position, it may change its magnitude. So, we can get the values of the live loads on the structures from the IS875 which is published in 1987. Then after wind load, we shall know what is known as the wind load. Now, when we construct structures in areas which have heavy winds blowing. Now, suppose we stand in a windy area, we feel the pressure of the wind uh, moving us away from our place. So, similar effect is there on the structures. So, the wind has an horizontal moving capacity. So, how do we calculate the wind pressure? To calculate wind pressure, we divide the, uh, we take into account the terrain, height and the shape of the structure. Then we express the intensity by means of basic pressure P. How do we calculate this basic pressure? We calculate the basic pressure from the values given in the IS 875 part 3. So, basically the country is divided into different zones based on the intensity of the pressure and a map is prepared for each of the zones. So, we open up these maps depending upon the height of the terrain, shape and size, we find out the wind load. Next comes the earthquake load. Now, as we said earthquake loads are due to the vibrations created by the earth. Now, when a structure is situated in earthquake prone areas, the areas which are likely to have earthquakes, then the structure should be designed to resist this, otherwise it leads to the failure. So, recently we have seen in the district of Lathur in Maharashtra state, there were lot of changes or lot of damage due to the earthquakes. So, if a structure is not constructed properly, taking into earthquake loads, it may lead to damage. So, to take into account the earthquake forces, these are given by the coefficients in IS 1893, that is a specific code of practice wherein it deals with the different uh, horizontal coefficients and vertical coefficients of earthquakes. Next, we shall see what are known as the erection loads. The erection loads are due to the storage and positioning of construction materials. So, the loads out of these should be taken into account for proper safety purposes. Then comes the secondary effects. Now, when we construct a structure, we restrict it movement. So, when we restrict the movements due to temperature changes, that is there is contraction and expansion. When we resist, stresses are developed. Also, when we have impact, vibration, creep and shrinkage, the stresses are developed. So, in order that the structure be safe, the structure should be able to resist all these things. So, now we know that there are different types of loads existing on the structure. So, how do we know what type of load act at a time on the members? So, let us see what are the load combinations. The load combinations are 1, the dead load and superimposed load or the live load. Second combination is dead load and the wind load or earthquake load along with the superimposed load. The third combination is dead load plus wind or earthquake load. Now, if you look carefully at all these three, we say it is either wind or earthquake, not both of them together. So, always wind and earthquake forces are not taken simultaneously. Now, once we know what are the sections used, what are the loads that are coming onto the structures, 
Now let us see what are the permissible stresses on the structure so that the structures are safe. To define the stress, the stress is defined as when a structural member is loaded, the deformation of member takes place and there is resistance to this deformation. This resistance is known as the stress. Now, what are the different types of stresses existing? The different types of stresses existing are axial tensile stress, axial compressive stress, then we have bending stresses out of bending loads or bending movements, we have bearing stresses which are we have also shear stresses arising out of shear loads. Now, what are the permissible limits of these sections? Now, the stresses they lead if not taken into account, they can lead to failure of the members. Now, according to Indian standard code that is IS 875, we have the standard set for permissible or safe stresses. Now, what is a permissible stress? A permissible stress is also known as working stress. Working stress is the stress which helps the member to be within the safe limits. It is evaluated by dividing the yield stress by factor of safety. So, coming to our discussion of different types of stresses, their permissible limits, please take a look at this particular tabular form. Here we have permissible stresses as per IS 800. So, first is the type of stresses. So, if it is axial tensile stress, the maximum limit is 0.6 Fy. Fy is the yield stress or yield strength of the steel used. Next, we, the, we have what is known as axial compressive stress. Its safe limit is 0.6 Fy. Then the bending compression and bending tensile stresses arising of bending moments, they should not exceed 0.66 times Fy. Then we said we have shear stresses out of shear loads. So, the maximum shear stress permitted is only 0.45 times the yield stress and the average shear stress permitted is 0.4 times the shear stress. The bearing stresses cannot exceed 0.75 times the yield stress of the steel used. Now, we have a fair idea of what is the steel structure, what are the sections that are used for structural members, what are the different types of loads that can come or act on a steel member and what are the different stresses that are set up in the steel member due to the action of loads and what are its safe permissible stress values. Now, we shall continue the discussion on design of beams in the next session. Thank you.